you don't have to do the same. You don't have to swirl it and we sniff don't, it. Okay. Like just, you know. What is the cacao percentage on this chocolate? Oh, fuck straight off. Just eat the chocolate. 60%. Can I tell you something? Yeah. That's really good chocolate. I know. Mm -hmm. I may not know wine, but I fucking know chocolate. Okay, so now try the wine. See what you think. Mm, yeah, still tastes like shit. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Wine and Wisdom. I'm here with my partner, Adam Rosenfeld. Dude, you are, you are a challenge because one of the things I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pair the wine with the person and the personality that I'm sitting with and you are the biggest, you're like my mission impossible. You don't really like wine. Nope. You, you don't like cheese. Hate it. Uh, you're gluten intolerant or- Not exactly. You, you think you are. You don't eat gluten. I don't have to be. Okay, so no crackers, no bread, no nothing. All the things that one would argue are meant to go with wine I ruled out with you. Uh -huh. Right. So this is what you brought. This is what I brought. I brought a, a schmedre, you might say, and that was for you. That's it's a little Yiddish for you. The red wine, the only red wine you've liked, you said, dude, I had that. You came back one night, you're like, we're on a date, and you were like, I had a chilled red wine. I really liked it. Great. What was it? I don't know. What was the varietal? I don't know. Not a lot of red wines are served chilled. So I went out and found a red wine for you that is, I don't know if it's meant to be served chilled, but it certainly can be served chilled. So this is, this wine's called a Gamay. That's the name of the varietal. Okay. Okay. It's from the Beaujolais region of France. It's definitely bougie. It's bougie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's just try the wine. Okay. Lachaim. Lachaim. Put your nose in there. Not the tongue, just the nose. Not the tongue, just the nose. It smells like wine. It does smell like wine. That's very, this, a very astute observation. What else do you smell? Uh, Alcohol. Good. All right, let's taste it. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> it's so good once it hits your lips. Yeah. Yeah. No, good. That was right. That was that was mm. that was perfect actually. The fruit had cheese. The fruit had cheese. <laughs> let's do that. Let me just bring this up here so I can show you guys what I'm talking about. Is this the right camera? Is this the right camera? It looks like head cheese, right? Like you see that on a board of meat and chocolate. What am I else? Well, like what else am I gonna expect that to be? I don't know, but let's just try it. So again, have a little bite. You know what it tastes like? I hope it tastes like apricots. That's what it is. Like a fruit roll up. It doesn't taste like any kind of juice I've ever had. Mmm. <laughs> Mm, that one hit the spot. Let's move on. All right, so obviously didn't work out as a mixologist, much as I'm sure you- Oh, it worked out great. Okay. <laughs> okay, but at a certain point, you move out to LA, you become an agent, and I think one of the misconceptions about agents at your level is that people think that like, you either just were born straight into doing that and you were successful right out of the gate, or it's always been that way, it came so easy for you, and you know, it's like no. any overnight success story, right? And I feel like the same goes for people in our industry or various other industries. So, so what was your plight? What, what, what was the path? Uh, it, it was a long path for me, and it was a lot of trial and tribulation and a lot of bumps in, in my journey, for sure. Um, I came out here in 2011, uh, moved across country on a whim. I really wasn't planning on staying in Los Angeles. I, I came here really to visit my brother, and I was in a weird kind of transitional time in my life. You know this, but I was, I was a career student. You know, I went to college, I graduated, I went to law school, I graduated, and then I went back to school again, and I was- so medical school. This close to going to medical school. Ah, you so, got into medical school. Correct. You didn't go. I didn't go. In the application process, I came out here, and I stayed with my brother for a while, and I kind of fell in love with the place. And I think the prospect of going back to school somewhere in the Midwest or back in like Florida just didn't seem all that appealing to me anymore. And I was burnt out and I was ready to just take a break. So I deferred for a year. And the reason that I got into real estate was really just kind of a coincidence. My brother had decided that he was gonna do his first house. He had zero experience in real estate or in development whatsoever. But growing up, everyone we ever knew that really had like true like intergenerational wealth had done it in real estate. Sure. You know, the tech bubble hadn't really happened yet and yep. crypto wasn't a thing. 
So lucky for you. It was, yeah, well, not so much, um, but it was real estate. So, you know, my brother being the pioneer that he is went for it and he went for it with a $700,000 house in Tarzana and he was going to do this flip and it was going to take him the better part of six months. And then he was going to go and sell it for like 1.2, $1.3 million was really the idea. Yeah. And he said to me being the amazing brother that he is, um, go get your real estate license. And if you get licensed, you can have a listing and you'll make a little bit of money and you'll see what it's like in the business world. So that's what I did. I, I went and because I had my law degree at the time, the requirements to get licensed were a little bit different. I didn't have to take any classes. I was just able to sit and take the test. And thank goodness, because I don't think I would have bothered with the classes. So I don't think I would have gotten licensed right. if I had to. So I got licensed and that, that project that he worked on that was supposed to take six months ended taking three years. And Welcome a lot of reasons why. Yeah, he had a really great partner who unfortunately passed away in a motorcycle accident through oh the early process of that development. Yeah. And he had to figure it out and it took a while. So I had to go to work and I started as an assistant. I emailed or called practically everybody in the city. So if you were an agent at the agency or at Hilton and Highlands back in 2011 or 12, check your inbox from you know 10 years ago. You'll probably see something from me. Uh, and, Saying what, what'd you say? Uh, hey, my name is Adam. You know, I went to law school. I'd like to be in real estate. Maybe I can be your assistant. Please respond. Right. Something along those lines. And now we a little more eloquent. And we receive now one of those emails. No, multiple. Every day. And as a result of my experience, I respond to every single one of them. I know you do. Um, That's the point I was trying to make. I know yeah. we do. I know you do. So that being said, I got almost no responses. The ones I got were not always pleasant, but there were a couple people who did respond, and I ended up going to work for an amazing guy, and he was great, and I learned a lot in that first year. His name was Josh Morrow. Josh, hope you're doing well, buddy. Um, and from there, I slowly transitioned out and I started to kind of do this on my own and it took a while and I had to figure out pretty quickly that in Beverly Hills in particular, if you're not born and raised here, you are at a tremendous disadvantage, right? So when you grew up here, your family have friends, you have friends, it's obviously a lot easier to dive into that world and sure. be successful right away. I, with the exception of my brother, was not able to do a, a deal for my first two years. It was very challenging for me. Yep. So I need to kind of you know, create a niche and, and carve a different path. And for me, seeing as development was always something that I aspired to do long term, that's really where I focused my business on the day to day. So I started to really study the market and study property from the perspective of a developer, how they would look at it. I started sending deals to developers because I, I realized really quickly they didn't care who my parents were or where I was raised. They just cared that I had good, good access to deals and that I hustled and that ideally I knew what I was doing and they could rely on me, right? I could advise them and there would be a trust and rapport built between us. Right. And pretty quickly I started to transact when I realized that that was a better focus for me. And I think for the first five or six years of my career, I'd say 60 to 70% of my business was that. It was essentially handing deals off to developers, letting them go through the process of developing, and then you know, there's an unwritten rule that if you're selling something to somebody, you're gonna get a piece of the back end. Right, but what you did, and unfortunately I see a, the mistake I find a lot of newer agents make is everybody wants business from developers, particularly in this market, right. but newer agents are trying to cut straight to the front of the line. They're going straight to the developer who's in the final stages of a project that they've been slaving over for the last three years. Someone like you brought them three years ago and saying, hey, can I list this for you? Hey, I have a buyer. When, as you said, there's sort of an unspoken rule that whoever brought you that deal should, in theory, get the listing. And right. again, what reason would a developer have to give an agent who they don't know, who maybe is newer and they don't have much of a reputation yet, that listing, as opposed to go out and hustle and find them the next deal? That's right. Yeah. The, the answer is none. There, there's no incentive. And I just didn't have the chutzpah to ask for that. Like that wasn't my business nor, model. The, nor would I, because I would yeah. have known that like, what leg do I have to stand on here? That being said, I respect the people that do, right? Like you can't get the business unless you ask unless for you it. Unless you ask for it, and sure. even though you might be like, you know, punching way above your weight class, like, listen, good on you, you know? Yeah. It just wasn't me. So for me, I had to start at the beginning and it was humbling, especially working as an assistant, like, you know, coming from the background that I come from, it was, one of those moments where like, I really had to kind of sit down, take a breath and understand this was gonna take a while. It wasn't gonna be overnight yep. and it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And luckily I'm an incredibly patient person. So I went to it and I got to work and over a couple of years it started to really pay off and it kind of creates the snowball effect, right? And right. we always talk about momentum is key, inertia is key and business begets more business. Right, and just ingratiating yourself, developers and people in that community and just providing value with no expectation in return. Right? The biggest listing we have right now, 1200 Bel Air for $139 million, was a listing that got brought to you by a developer who you had 
been you know, working for years to cultivate a relationship with, to always try to bring as much value to the table as possible with no expectation of anything in return. You never asked for anything. You always were there as a sounding board and to provide him with you know, comps or to be able to show him off markets when you had them available. And then, you know, to me, this is where like, the universe repays. This is whether you want to call it karma, whether you want to call it you know, law of attraction, or whatever you want to call it, ultimately that good deed came back full circle. Yeah, you call it whatever you want. I just call it, you know, the golden rule, right? Which is like, do unto others. And, you know, like we all have kind of models that we live by, whether conscious or subconscious. And that's always been one of mine. Like it's, it's not hard to be nice to people and to be kind to people. And I very much strive to do that. I hope I don't have to try too hard, but I do try and I'm conscious of it. Listen, you take care of others, right? Our business model in particular is, you know, looking out for people like you're truly an advisor. We never sell. Right? Yep. We're never really selling anything. We're there to advocate and to advise yep. and to be an ambassador. And if we do our jobs well, it's going to keep opening new and new doors. Uh, and that's just by taking care of people. When you take care of people specifically in this business, you are inherently taking care of yourself. So if you can eliminate the myopia of the money that's involved in every deal that you could potentially be earning, learn not to count your money before the check closes or before the deal closes and really just focus on, am I doing right by the client? Yeah. It's going to serve you so much better in the long run. 100%. And that's really been my ethos and, and I know your ethos and I think that's why we work so well together. Totally. All right. Let's take a break here because you have to try the prosciutto. You've never tried prosciutto, which is like as shocking to me as, well, I don't know. Like I'm just done being shocked. I'm honestly, I'm exhausted for being shocked. I trust me. I don't, you will be the first person I've ever met that doesn't like prosciutto if you don't like that. It's delicious. Sorry, Grandma. I'm gonna have some with you. Okay. This is just one bite, like what do we do here? Yeah. Okay. No, hey it. Hey it. Already? Hey it, yeah. What are you talking yeah, about? You haven't even it. tried it. No, uh -uh. <laughs> Mental aversion. Mm -mm. What do you mean mental aversion? No, uh -uh. Dude. Uh -uh. What part, you're gonna spit it out? Yeah. You're gonna spit it out? I am. <laughs> Not even joking. Ugh. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. Talk, not, talk not me it. through this. Was it, is it texture? No, it no. can't be taste. I actually like the texture. Texture's great. So it's taste? Yeah. Nope. So, um, Can I have the chocolate now or am I still not? Okay, I'll just have this. I mean, I wouldn't have it right after the prosciutto. That's just a weird pairing. But again, mm. you just shove shit down your gullet. Like, you don't really care. I have a big appetite, usually. Yeah. There's a few things that I have an aversion to. Ham would be one of them. I don't like ham, right. for the record. I tried it. I'll try anything twice. That was once. One more time. We'll give it a little bit of time. And maybe we'll come back to it. Hmm. <laughs> I can't be the only one that finds you this funny. I think so. Uh, it's my, you're my man crush. <laughs> Back at you, kiddo. It's the only reason why I wanted to partner with you. I was like, I'll take it. I fucking love that guy. Whatever it is, I'm really glad you did it because things are going well. Why, why did you want to do partner? Because I love you, bro. Oh. It's the truth. Look, we sat down. You took me to dinner. Mm. I closed the deal. A, yep. a really big deal. Yep. Huge being, deal. Being the mensch that you are, you took me out to dinner to basically celebrate as like a congratulations. Yeah. And we sat there. We talked. We drank a little bit wasn't wine that night because I don't like I, wine that much. I brought, that. I brought a bottle right, and, we and you it. went, I don't drink wine. And I went, ugh. And I put the wine aside and yes. I don't remember what we drank, but I was having a conversation with you and I was basically saying like, I think I'm ready to like make a move, a transition. Thinking yeah. I would just go to a different company. Yeah. At which point you drunkenly said. <laughs> I like drunkenly said. Uh, what about <laughs> working together? Ah, uh, I might've been drunk. Yeah, That's true. a little bit. Yeah. Turned out to be the biggest mistake you ever made. <laughs> the best thing I ever did. <laughs> But like eight, nine months later, here we are. And it's been awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm so incredibly honored that you said yes, that you decided to partner with us. Because yeah. I, I, there was nobody in this industry that I would have even entertained partnering with. Um, it's not even more or less, just period, full stop. So you asked me not long ago, you were like, who is number two? I was like, who's number two what? Like, who is the second choice? There was no second choice. There was no choice. It was just a, God, if ever, that would be really like, and, and I remember after, you know, a few weeks of conversation, you came into the office and we had, you know, our, our senior leadership or like, you know, our core, sort of our core council. You, you, you want, what? You want to bring in a partner? Because we need another voice in the room? Like, what are you, crazy? And we came into the office on a Saturday for what was meant to be like a 30 minute meet and greet and sat there for over three hours. And I remember you got up and left and I looked around the room and everybody went, that was pure magic. <laughs> like, holy shit, what you guys could do together could just be in 
incredibly special. Yeah, I thank you very much. You know, typically I would have something sarcastic to say. I'm only thing I can really say to that, like in all sincerity and genuineness, is, is thank you. You know, it was uh, a very easy decision for me to make. You know, originally I, I said to you when we're sitting at the table, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. But I can promise you that regardless what I do or what I decide to do, I will absolutely see this through with you before I, before I make any decision. Yep, I remember that. And some other opportunities came up, but when I really looked at it, you know, my mind and my heart, or really my brain and my heart aligned on this one. And it's just being clear. No, I, I agree with you. I think that like my, my sort of overarching goal is that you can do great things and be a great person at the same time. They're not in conflict with 1, one another. 1,000%. Yeah. Like business tends to be cutthroat. Our industry is really cutthroat. It can be ruthless. Uh, one thing I talk about this all the time, right? The relationships with your clients are so impactful and so meaningful. It's the relationships with your peers in the business, the other agents that I actually think are even more meaningful. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but you know, to have that kind of relationship with your peer, um, is everything to me. It's like, where else are you going to get more pertinent information from? You know, how are you going to be as successful at your business if you don't have the right relationship with the person on the other side? You know, when I have an opportunity to pick the person I'm working with, be it in a multiple situation or a situation to coalesce and I have a say in it, who am I going to go to other than somebody else in the business that I have that much trust and respect for? So for me, that was always tremendously important. And you know this, a lot of the referral business that we get actually comes from other agents as opposed to just other regular yeah. people in the community. Yep. So, you know, just another little thing that, uh, that I hang my hat on, you know, it's something that I certainly don't lose sight on and, and that I preach to those on our team, you know, be, be a broker's broker. Yep. Totally. Of most importance. All right. Let's try the chocolate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm not particularly, I'm not, I'm not particularly a wine and chocolate guy. Why? Because I think that the chocolate's too overpowering. Once I get that amount of sugar in my mouth, it just overpowers the wine. And to me, now you're all, it's all I'm tasting. So, and, you, and the wine gets really kind of tart and bitter. Do you like me. chocolate in general? Too. I don't know. I'm just, you're made, making a comment. Yeah, of course. I mean, you're hitting me with this thing. I'm thinking you're a sociopath. So I'm just like. You know I like chocolate. We no, bonded over chocolate. What, what are you talking about? I introduced you to Scotch Mallows at Seas Candy. You okay, know right. it. I, I love I, chocolate. I yeah. take that comment back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I'm not going to feed you. I mean, you grab a chocolate. Hershey's? What do we have here? No, it's from a, a chocolatier on um, Cannon across the street in Wally's. What's, what's it called? I don't know. Well, they should get some love too, John, during oh, the episode. Uh, the place across the street from Wally's. Good job, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, you haven't tried it yet. Maybe okay. it's not. Yeah. You don't have to do the same. You don't have to swirl it and we sniff don't, it. Like okay. just, you know. What is the cacao percentage on this chocolate? Oh, fuck straight off. Just eat the chocolate. 60%. Mm. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Yeah. That's a really good chocolate. I know. Mm. I may not know wine, but I fucking know chocolate. Okay, so now try the wine. See what you think. Mm, yeah, it still tastes like shit. <laughs> <laughs> is as good of a place to end as I can possibly, I mean, that brings it all full, full circle. That's pretty much where we started. That's pretty much where I expected we were end. So, cheers, dude. I love you. Love you too, buddy. One day, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm, st I'm still holding out hope. One day. Let's keep trying. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. I love you, bud. Love you too, buddy. It's such a pleasure. Hey, guys. It's Wine and Wisdom. I'm here with my partner, Adam. John. Nobody cares. <laughs> Literally, literally nobody cares. Or don't, according, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>